Topo Athletic is committed to lifelong health and better movement. Topo builds running shoes for those who get out there every day, regardless of weather, speed, energy, or mood. Their distinctive fit and feel combines instinctive human movement with modern performance and lightweight comfort to help you keep going, keep trying, and keep moving. Discover the Topo difference and step into a run experience unlike any other. All right. Hello, everybody, and hold on. Welcome to the... Uh... Welcome to the 51st Fireside Chat. I think it's number 51. My name is Om Gandhi. I'm one of the uh, co-owners of Run Try Bike. And today we have Jen Spieldener. Um, I think I butchered that again. Um, Jen's going to correct me on that one. But I'm about to invite Jen here to the show. Jen, Blue 70 Ambassador. And she's got an amazing story for you today. So I'm really excited to bring her on the show. Uh, just wanted to give a shout out to all of our partners for being a part of our journey with us. Thank you so much. We're just getting Jen here on the show and I'm adjusting my, uh, I'm adjusting my makeshift stand because we, uh, we're, we still haven't gotten like a stand stand. Like I've got like cups over here, like this Arvipa damn good run one. There's Jen. Um, oop, and she is requesting to be in the video. There we go. So she should be joining us in just a minute. All right. And we're super excited to get into this one. Um, you know, it's meta. Meta has always got to have like some technical difficulties here, but we'll get it. One, two, three. You guys, have, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they've been with us long enough to know that, like, that happens, like, one out of five times. And it, I was just telling them this is our 51st fireside chat. So we've had, like, that, that definitely, we've had a bunch of, funny stories and a bunch of things just happen on this show and um you're actually you might actually be the one year episode uh of the show which That's is exciting. which is amazing um so we got jen is it spiel dinner did i get it you got it good job <laughs> um and we got somebody in the chat morgan saying go jen um, yeah i was with morgan at masters so here in um, yeah <laughs> So how are you today? Uh, uh, I'm doing pretty good. How about you? Not too bad. Just trying to adjust my makeshift stand here, but <laughs> um, but it's all good. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for coming on the show, and I'm super excited to get to chat with you. Um, we just talked in the green room, and within 15 minutes of talking, it sounds like we've already got a lot in common, so it's going to be a great conversation. Um, but I wanted to start by... Um, just kind of before getting into how you started on your endurance sports journey, I wanted to start with the icebreaker, um, just to like break the ice. Um, but, uh, it doesn't seem like you've listened to any of the other fireside chats. So here we go. Uh, pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? Mm, probably nay. Oh, man, man, you might be the first person. Um, I might have to call Jason to do the rest of his interview because he's a traditional New Yorker and I'm like, team, I'm always like team pineapple and like the last five have been pineapple and it was stacking up, but Jason can be happy that he's got somebody on, uh, on, uh, team nay for pineapple on pizza. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's good. Um, but yeah, so just, uh. Just tell me a little bit about how you got started in endurance sports. I guess I grew up swimming. I always thought I'd go to the Olympic and, Olympics in swimming. And then I, I started running in middle school. And I liked a boy. Of course, I liked a boy. And he ran distance. And so I thought, well, I'll run distance. And then I guess that was like middle school. And then high school, I started actually getting a lot better at running. And somebody people in Finley noticed and were like, why don't you try triathlon? And so I tried that junior or senior year of high school. And then somebody like contacted 
me from USA Triathlon saying like, we want to train you for the Olympics or thought it was, we just ignored it. Um, and then sent it again. And so maybe we're like, maybe this isn't fake. Um, and then like did a race down in Claremont, like an IT race. So that's kind of how my triathlon journey started was I did IT racing. Um, maybe that's like draft legal. That's what they do in the Olympics. Um, so like, it's like Peloton style on the bike. Um, and did that and qualified for like world championships as like a junior athlete, kind of did that under 23, um, got a full ride to run in, at Toledo for running and did that. So definitely wanted to go to college and get my degree, uh, but then graduated from college in 2008, kind of raced in the summers for triathlon and then started doing triathlon full time from 2008 until I did my last race in 2020, um, December of 2020, I did Daytona. So I'm still technically a professional triathlete. I think my license expires at the end of this year. And I won't lie, like I thought about coming back to do a race just to like have it extend out three more years. Um, Cause my career definitely didn't end on my terms, but it's, it, it's not for the right reasons why I'd be racing. So not probably gonna do that. Yeah. Sure. Um, it's, it's funny that you mentioned like a professional license cause I didn't even know, I mean, I'm a trail runner and Jason definitely knows more about triathlon than I do, but I didn't even know that there was such thing as like a license to be a professional. Yeah, so I think people think that like, like elite triathletes that are like high up in the age group are pros, but no, you actually have to have your pro license. You have to qualify for it. You have to like prove it every, like with a result with certain, like like certain race, like percentages behind the winner and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, it expires after three years. So say I like let it expire, I'd have to race as an age grouper and re-earn my license. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of like, like the final step of like saying like, Hey, I'm done with, this. I'm done doing this. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah. 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 You were doing it for, and you were doing it for almost 12 years as a professional and um, like, oh, for, yeah, 15, like from 2005 to 2020. Yeah. It was my whole life. Like high end, like high performance athletics was my whole life. So definitely different what I'm doing now, but it's all good. Designed for running adventures on a variety of surfaces, the Catula Exospikes footwear traction are at home on ice and snow, as well as on dry, rocky ground. Twelve ultra-durable tungsten carbide spikes provide an impressive amount of grip when you need it, and stand up to rocks and other abrasive trail features when you don't. Exospikes will inspire you to follow the trail less traveled, even when it's covered in ice. For more information, visit Catula.com. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's something that we talked about in the green room and I'm glad we're kind of getting into it because I think there's a lot of people who are trying to balance, I think not only professionals who have transitioned into a normal life, but also people who are kind of trying to find a balancing act between the two or people who've been doing endurance sports their whole life. And it's sort of become like a part of their identity, even people who just started. Um, so tell me about like that transition from like being a professional triathlete to um, doing because you you're now doing taxes for Wendy's, right? Your tax accountant. I'm a tax accountant for Wendy's. That's correct. That's a super <laughs> the big, cool picture, by the way. <laughs> thank you. I got second. I I lost to Shrek and a donkey. Kind of disappointing, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, their, their costume was their costume was better. I will I will concede my. My loss, but um, yeah. I mean, I think I did an okay. J I think I did a good job, like having, like trying not to wrap my identity. Like definitely, when I was younger, my identity was really wrapped up into like my performances and like my my value as a person depended if I like did well. And I think I learned that I cannot uh, value who I am as a person by my results. So I started kind of doing that work before I even transitioned out. And I definitely had. Um, like, like, I don't know if they're hobbies, but I definitely had interest outside of the sport. So then when my time came, like it, it's just, no matter what, it's like a hard transition. It's like something that you focused your whole life around. Um, you know, I swam, bike and ran. I traveled a lot. I 
you know, my whole life just being the fastest I could be at something and like also like not being balanced because like trying to be very good at something like you're definitely not balanced. Um, and so like kind of trying to figure out that and how that looks once you like remove yourself from the sport and um, yeah, I don't know. It's I'm happy with what I'm doing. And I'm definitely, I exercise quite a bit and it took me a second to want to get it back on a start line. I didn't race again, tried to race in 2021 and it just wasn't mentally right for me at the time. And uh, finally did something at the end of last year. So, yeah. Uh, and now I like can't even get the bug back because it is addicting. I'm sure everybody can relate to how addicting this stuff is. Um, and I definitely part of me is like always kind of having an athletic goal, but then like the balance part of it. So yeah, I have a corporate job and Wendy's is super supportive. And like, you know, they said like, if you want to race again, we can support that. And I'm like, but I, I want a family and like, I have, a, like, I want to like spend time with my significant other and my friends and my family. And I, I like want to create, like, I want to have a baby. Like, so I have to, you have to prioritize kind of what you want to do. And I got to do that part of my life for, better part of 20 years and so now it's time to have other goals and i don't know i guess i'm maybe not answering your question for other people no it's uh no that totally makes sense and i think that's part of like what people who are doing the sport as a hobby are always trying to figure out is like they want to do the thing that they love because they have the bug but then it's like you know you have kids and you have a family and yeah you know there's mom there who have like three kids and then there's somebody out there who has a corporate job um like tax accountant which by the way is, thank you for taking this week uh, to talk to us because i know it's a tough week to be a tax accountant i, I would imagine yeah it definitely is not an easy week here but no i'm just grateful for the opportunity but yeah i mean i think like having the other responsibilities in life it doesn't mean you can't like you know go after big athletic goals it's just you have to just be realistic with yourself and then sorry that's a dog um prioritize we love running buddies so we love running. i think it's yeah you just have to figure out like what is you know like what are your key sessions and just making sure like those maybe happen during the week and you need to be flexible like life isn't rigid there's things that happen and things that come up and you know you just have to be flexible with what you your time allows you to do be creative Creative. And as you get older, you have to be creative. That's what I tell my older friends. I'm getting older too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that um that makes total sense to just be like creative with your sessions and just being flexible. And that's something that you know I learned going into my fifth year of running now is just like, you know, sometimes you have to take that unplanned rest day. Sometimes you're like, sometimes you might have have a good day and you're like I can go a little farther today sometimes you're having a terrible day and you didn't sleep well and you're stressed and your heart rate's through the roof and you're like today is not it you know yeah. um I totally agree with that and like you really just need to be as you get older typically you get better at listening to your body and kind of knowing yourself and I think just adjusting to that and stress is stress so people think like oh I'm running 100 miles a week or whatever it is or I mean that's like a really crazy number but that's not the only stress that's going on in your life. I mean, if you're not sleeping, if you're happy, like there's just so many other stresses and all those need to be accounted for. Totally. And, you know, and, you know I'm pulling it up here, but you actually made a, uh, you actually made a post about that um, a while back. Um, <laughs> where you're just basically saying, that, yeah, I do my leg work on uh, everybody who comes on the show because I want to ask all the right questions. But um, yeah. you, uh, you mentioned um, continuing to move forward after getting gut checked, and you said it's okay to struggle, you know, and you know, yeah. it's like it's an opportunity to learn and grow. So just talk about that for our viewers, you know, as somebody who has been competitive most of their life and trying to find that balance, you know, of like having grace for yourself and like moving forward with the struggles and learning and growing. Yeah, I think like anytime you have like anything negative or it's an opportunity to grow. I think about all the hard things I've gone through and they've taught me something about myself or uh, just life in general. Like sometimes I think too that 
as humans, we all have like these rites of passage. Like I just had to put one of my dogs down on St. Patty's Day. And it was like my first time ever having to do that. And uh, it was awful. It was the worst day of my life. But like in that process, I learned a lot. And uh, I don't know. And and it was a rite of passage that a lot of people have had to do before me and that we'll continue to have to do. And like it connects us all like as humans, like to have to have that experience, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think like struggling is a is a good thing and we can learn so much and uh yeah if you take the opportunity to learn from it and you know view it as an asset or something like that and that that's a tax word <laughs> versus yeah anyways well well you know since we're talking about struggling and learning from it uh, let's kind of uh, let's shift the story back to like um 2005 to 2020 when you were racing um professionally uh when did you did you have any dnfs uh, that impacted you and what were your takeaways like if you had any particular memorable experiences what were like your takeaways from that from dnfing yeah uh, dnfing is the worst i think people that have raced and they've had a dnf it's definitely the worst feeling um i've had all different types of dnf i've had like mechanical D dnfs like where my I've had two flaps on the bike. Um, I've had heat stroke type DNFs, like, uh, like where my body just kind of gives out. Um, uh, that might be the only DNFs I've had. I've I had, imagine like, both of those might hit you differently too, because a mechanical one is like, dang, like it's out of my control, but it's, it was also sort of in my control. And then the heat stroke is like, oh, that's it's not a good idea to continue, you know? No, no for sure. And uh, body kind of takes care of that one by shutting down so that's positive i guess like to do further damage i guess there's one time that i knew i was approaching the heat stroke when i was in new orleans and i did decide to just walk off the course and i chose to dnf but pretty much i would i would my dnfs were all kicking and screaming getting me off the course there's definitely a lot of races that i finished that i should have just dnf um like kona when i did kona in 2019 definitely should have dnf that race but I wanted to finish. And so I walked, I probably walked the majority of that marathon. Um, and yeah, that's just, it's just part of sport. It's part of trying to do this endurance crap and going like pushing your body outside. It's not crap, it's, but like trying to push your body outside the limits and completely out of your, you're definitely not comfortable. And, you know, things get thrown your way. Like in Kona, I was vomiting all, I vomited for three hours. Um, and continued to vomit when I got off the bike, couldn't keep anything down and was also going through some personal stuff that just, yeah, it was, I got hip. I also like fast, like I didn't have to race. This is in 2019. I got hit by a race moto uh, oh, in Santa Rosa. So that was a, that was a different type of DNF. Um, so yeah, like a, the race moto just T-boned me. And uh, so that's another way you can end a race. <laughs> That's not, it actually, um, that was, yeah, not great. There's a lot of mixed emotions on that one, but, um, yeah, so that happened. Kona was my first time racing since getting hit by a moto. And if anybody's raced Kona, I mean, there's so many motos out there. There's like the wind, there was so much, um, so many things I was trying to overcome during that race. That was really hard. Yeah. But yeah. And I would imagine that Kona, like, it's one thing that if you DNF a training race or something, or like a race that's on your calendar where you're like, this is not the race, you know, like I can dial it back if I'm not having a good day. It's another thing when you're out in Kona and you're like, this is Kona, you know, I can't. Well, it's like, it's also like my family flew out there. It's not like, it's not a cheap event. Like, it's very expensive to get out there. Like, a lot was kind of invested. I also like, really didn't want to have a reason to ever go back again like personal stuff leading into the race i never really wanted to go back so i think like if i wouldn't have finished i would have felt the need to go back obviously like i had expectations i really wanted the top 10. i mean heat and humidity has never been my thing um and you know I, that was my second ironman of my life i think ironman would have been the distance i would have like i'm the most suited for um just yeah, because like Louisville was so great in 2018, like first Ironman, win it out the gate and then have the Kona experience and then just not 
then COVID happened and then I'm not racing anymore. So there's never really another opportunity to do that. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, now flipping the tables, are there any races where you, that you're, that may necessarily not have been your best performances, but ones that you're like really, really proud of for overcoming something like maybe not heat and humidity, but something, uh, something, you know? I guess like when you said that, it, I actually had a good performance. This was like Timberman, which is not, it was in New Hampshire for, uh, I don't even know if it's still around. Um, I think it was in New Hampshire, but I think it was 2016. And the airlines damaged my bike on the way there, so it cracked my fork. Oh, no. And like, like the night before the race, I was it was still without a bike. And I remember driving to bike shop to bike shop trying to find it. And I'm short, so I'm like five three. Um, and my my wheels were still okay. And my coach was like, "We just need to get you. You're gonna race with your wheels. We just need to get you a bike." But at that time, I was riding 650s, which are like, that's also very hard to find a bike that would fit 650s. Um, and then I think Heather Jackson's mom's friend or something had a bike, and they brought it the morning of the race. So this is like really overcoming a lot of control. And the morning of the race, the like the mechanics, like we had it all planned, like they just switched over the wheels. And I ended up getting, I think, third behind Rennie. Rennie was second. And I think Meg's like uh, to say or got first. And that's like a pretty decent result. And I wasn't that far behind Rennie on like this. I don't recommend ever riding a bike with a saddle. You've never, for, it was a half. It was only a half. But like that was um, definitely, I'm pretty. Like that was one of my takeaways from racing. And that, that's something I'm super proud of that I got through that. And I didn't give up. And like mentally was just really strong through that whole day and that whole process, the whole weekend. So Yeah. What is your mindset going into stuff like that? Where do you have like a mantra that you get into when you get deep into the hurt locker, the pain cave um, that you repeat to yourself or. Um, I, is there... uh, maybe not like, I think I really like. I like being the underdog. I like having hard things that I have to overcome. Sometimes I think the harder I have to overcome it, I always feel like I'm going to excel better than somebody else that might be faster than me. Cause I think mentally I can just get myself to the space that I just focus on the task at hand. And I think I can just get really like laser focused and really just, this is what I'm doing. Like, this is what I'm doing right now and just push, push, push. I, I think throughout my whole career, I've always had different mantra, like mantras, like nothing's ever, I feel like during that time frame, I was wearing, I know I was wearing a bracelet. I wish I could remember. Cause they, I think as you change, like I don't think you should get too attached to one thing because as you like evolve and you change, I think like what speaks to you and what motivates you changes as you grow and as you change. So I think like getting attached or like that is you might be doing a disservice for yourself. I, I mean, that's just for me. And uh, I think I forget now that you're going to make me think because definitely was when I was going through some personal crap as well. And definitely just um, I always just think I'm always stronger than you're always stronger than you think you are. I mean, you yeah. can always you. The, no one gives themselves enough credit. We're always our heart, like our worst critic. I think just realizing that um, is good too. Anyways. Yeah, we, we had a we had a sports psychologist on the show, uh, Krista Haskell, who has written an article for her, um, our January February issue, the uh, inner coach versus the inner critic, and that one really made me think because it's like if you really just stop and listen to all the things that you're saying to yourself, it is just unreal, like how you can really be your own worst enemy, you know? Yeah. And that's definitely something I've like worked on with my therapist. Cause I am, I am insanely critical of myself to like sometimes the detriment. And uh, that's like, that's part of like me figuring out my balance. Like sometimes you just have to say like, this is good enough. And uh, I don't know. It's yeah. Like, calling yourself names and like trying to like bully yourself to get something done isn't like always the way but I will say on the trying to like um figure out a new path 
path of like talking to myself when I've only really had success with beating myself up is kind of, it's a whole different ride that I'm trying to figure out. I'm like, well, I know I have success being like insanely difficult on myself, but can I maybe have success being a little bit kinder to myself? And like, you know, that, and that's like kind of what I'm playing with, what I have been playing with the last couple of years. And sometimes, yeah, I, I do see like, it's just, it's just different, different approach. Totally. Um, yeah. I want to go back to something you just said about um, uh, like evolving and changing your why and just kind of like uh, just evolution over, over time, I, I would say. Um, you know, as somebody who's been doing professional, has been doing endurance for their entire life, has also been doing it on a competitive level and did it from 2005 to you know, 2020, almost 15 years. Um, what is your key um, coming in season after season and doing something, anything, and I will say anything in life, you know, doing it at a high level for that long. Um, what, what is your, what was your key to your longevity in being able to like endure in this sport and stay in this sport for that long? Um, I think I had good support. I had really good supportive parents. Um, but I think like I, as I got older, like at, in 2005, I was, you know, 19 and I, I, like I told, I think I told you before, like we started the live part is, you know, I lived and died with my results type thing. Like, you know, I kind of had a lot of attachment to my results and I think learning that I'm not my results, like for, for one thing, none of us are what we do, like that be career or whatever, like we're way more than that. And I think having like, feeling like I'm more than just my results or more than just my job title. Like, it's just, you know, it's super important to like, know that you're more than that and know who you are as a person, like who you are, like outside of what you do. Um, and, and I think like, as I've like, as I like got into the sport and got deeper into the sport, I started taking a little bit longer breaks, not getting I know people get like super worried if they take more than two weeks. Like I took seven week breaks. <laughs> so like I would think four to seven week breaks. I mean, I'm active. It's not like I didn't do anything for those times, but I did whatever I wanted. Cause I think mentally you also need to like disengage from like the, you know, the very strategic and all planned out sessions. Like sometimes it's like you want to wake up and just be like, today I'm going to do this. And I think that like contributed to my longevity. I, you know, I was part of like a group that I like really made really good, good friends with. I think having that community um, and like I grew, I was still in Finley when I was racing. Now I live in Columbus, but I had a good group of community there. Um, I think surrounding yourself with good people, people that you enjoy being around. I think that helped my longevity, uh, just different things. And like, you kind of just learn as you go definitely what I was doing in 2005 was definitely not what I was doing in 2020. <laughs> say that. But. Yeah, I, mean, I, I mean, it definitely makes sense because, you know, like going, not only were you growing within the sport and evolving within the sport, you were also, you know, life was still going and you were 19 when you started and then, you know, 34 towards the end. And that person you were when you were 19 is not who you were when you were 34. So it's just, it's, it's crazy to think about, you know, like evolving in the sport and also evolving in life. Yeah. And like sport also teaches you things like you're going to learn a lot about yourself. You said you're an ultra runner. So I'm sure you learn a lot about yourself at like mile 90 for doing mile races yeah. and like coming from somebody that, you know, did that. I mean, you, you learn, you get, you get pretty acquainted with yourself. Uh, doing that stuff because you're definitely pushing yourself out of your like out of your comfort zone um just very eye-opening and i i'm you know i'm grateful i found sport like when i did like a long time like i'm just happy like my life had that part of it because it it's even though i'm not racing like professionally anymore like it's still a huge part of my life like i swim with the masters group i have a bunch of friends i run with i ride my cross bike on the trip like i'm still very active and i'm you know it's going to be a huge part of my life forever and like the people that you attract doing sport and it's just it's great yeah yeah the community 
community is incredible. Like I've always maintained that if tomorrow I can run at the level I'm running right now, I would still volunteer at trail races. I would still go up to events and, you know, it's just, I said I came for the sport and I'm staying, one of the big reasons I'm staying is just the amazing community and the people you meet who are so focused on like, like growing and evolving and um, just, you know, living their why um, through these sports, using these sports as a conduit. Um, yeah. yeah, for sure. Uh, so one of the things that we also talked about in the green room that you've definitely been vocal about on your page um, and um, that I think a lot of people struggle with but are afraid to talk about it um, for various reasons, you know, um, is eating disorder. So, you know, going through your page, uh, one of the things I saw that stood out to me was one sentence that your coach said to you when you were 13 years old, like, you, if you dropped a few pounds, you would be a better swimmer. So talk about that yeah. and how that impacted you and what it means to tell kids that age something like that, you know? Yeah, I think I was in eighth grade when that was said to me. So I was 12 or 13. I was young for my grade. Um, and yeah, like just drop the line. Like if you lost a few pounds, you'd be faster. And so I proceeded to lose, I think, 30 pounds. And yeah, like I will tell you, like at first I did get a little bit quicker. So you get that reward and then you get the attention. And when you're 12 and 13 and your coach who you like you idolize is giving you attention because guess what? Now you're fast. Now you're faster and you get that, you know, uh, attention. So then it like just feeds it. And then it came, it got too out of control. Obviously I lost way too much weight. And then it's like the flip where, well, now you need to put on weight. Well, you, you started this. Like you, you can't just stop it like that. It doesn't work that way. It's a comment that definitely, you know, it changed my life. It's 12 or 13, however, when you stop eating like that, I already had, I was already having my periods. Well, that stopped, um, started having like bone issues and had, I don't know, 12 or 13 stress fractures over the course of 10 years. Like we talked about, like how I was diagnosed with osteoporosis, like had female triad, had to see a bone doctor because they were concerned, you know, I had bone issues because I had four stress fractures in one year. Um, but those are like the consequences of not getting, like giving your body the nutrients it needs and that type of, like it just, you just can't do those things, especially when you're going through puberty. And at that age, uh, kids are so impressionable and especially by people that they look up to like a coach. And so I think like, words that we use and how we approach weight because you know weight is it it can there, at some point like weight is important but not like i think we think that a one size body fits everything you know like you have to be rail thin to be a fast runner or you need to have this or that to do this and people i've had a shit ton of people tell me i can't believe you're as fast as you are like and i'm a good swimmer i can't believe how fast you're a swimmer you're so short you know and like People say stuff about my quads, like you don't, um, you got quads like that just swimming. Like that's what somebody said to me at the pool. No, I, I do other things too. Thank you. <laughs> but um, I think people just, it's just society, like body image and all that stuff is just front and center and, you know, changing. There's, I think there are constructive ways to approach the subject and, um, it's just, it's maybe a little bit of ignorance and people not intentionally trying to say anything negative. Like you got to give people grace. They're just trying to be nice. I, I mean, they're trying to give you a compliment. Uh, and, you know, no one's trying to hurt somebody, I don't think. And uh, it's just like our words, like I wrote that before, like our words, like words, uh, they mean something and you need to kind of be, think about what you kind of say sometimes. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's how mine started. and. I was telling you before, like I swim with a master's group and I think they have like an age group swim team, probably high school kids. And they have like a list of things that they could, you know, improve upon, like to get faster at swimming. And the first thing on the list was BMI. And to me, it's just like, why are we valuing that? Like, like why is that even on the list? I don't know. I mean, we could say like, just to be at, 
feed your body the nutrients it needs yeah you know to perform at your best like it's everybody's body type is different like com trying to conform like they said to like a certain type it's just not going to be conducive to yourself and being the fastest and the best that you can be um but that's just my personal take yeah and i mean one of the things that uh stood out to me as far as like that post that you made which drew really impactful to me is that you know i used to be 250 pounds uh when i was 18 years old yeah uh, and i struggled with losing a bunch of weight to get to the bottom of the spectrum even just a few years ago as i was diving into ultra running just was like dropped my weight down like immensely and i did get faster to start with but it ended up biting me in the end and i've really had to work on my relationship with food so one of yeah. the things that stood out to me and it's something that i've talked about before too is that you know you, you don't really with things like body image and eating disorders, you don't really just get over it. It's something that you sort of compartmentalize. So talk about that a little bit, because we did chat about that in the, the green room a little bit. Yeah, I think like once you kind of have that, it's kind of with you forever. I don't think it's just like I'm cured. I don't think it controls me. It's, you know, what I, I don't, there's things like it's like, you know, when I get super stressed sometimes, like it's kind of like a trigger for me to not, like, cause it's a control thing too. So eating disorders are, are a control disorder. So it's kind of like when everything's chaotic, it's like, well, I can control this. Um, and so just kind of knowing those type of things and being aware um, and not wanting to go down that path. Because I think like food is, like we need food to perform, we need food to live. Like food isn't like the enemy here. Um, but you know, somebody, I kind of always say like everything in moderation, like nothing's really bad, but that's kind of like my motto a little bit. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just view food that I need food so I can do what I want to do. Like, and my body's going to be what my body's going to be. I, like my, your body sets. It's interesting to me. Like my body is, been the same like you know i was concerned about gaining weight when i got out of it but hell like it seems like if i fuel my body appropriately it stays the same because everybody's body's kind of set to a certain kind of point i mean yeah like you don't overeat and all that stuff when you exercise and those things but it's body kind of just calibrates yeah you know? totally um it's just the importance of knowing that like food is like you know, you need those nutrients, you need food to live. Um, and, you know, for most of us, you know, especially those of us who are like in the mid to the back of the pack or doing this as a hobby, you know, um, you know, as long as you're having everything in moderation, like as nutritionists on the show have told us, you know, like, you know, you could get run over by a bus tomorrow, but eat the donut, you know, like have the fried, you know, go get that ice cream, you know, yeah. Yeah. like, for sure. Live life, you know. Um, but <laughs> definitely agree with you about like just different body types. And I do like the suggestion of like putting on the board, like just telling kids from an early age, like get the nutrients that you need, you know, make sure you're getting like your protein, your carbs. Well, um, educating them that, like educating them with that, like that information. Like yeah. setting them up with the tools that like you need to get you know, food in you after a workout. So you like recover better and like you need to have food before you work out. And like, if you're doing like a long, hard session, like maybe we need to be, ha you need to be having carbs during the session. Like just, and if you're like fueling your body properly, guess what? The weight's going to take care of itself. Like everybody's, you're going to be at your optimal weight to perform. And so if you just look at it that way, like we don't really need to talk about, you know, skin fold tests and like, we don't need to do weigh-ins because it, it all will just, and at that, at like that age group level and stuff, like that, that stuff doesn't need to be considered. Like we're not trying to win an Olympic gold medal. And I don't know. Yeah. So I'm not, I, I don't know, but people can get attached to their goals. However they want to get attached to their goals. I'm not here to tell people how to get attached or what to, what to invest in. You know what I mean? Totally. But the last thing you want to do is like tell kids, like watch out for your BMI. You know, it's just not a <laughs> to somebody. Yeah is 13 and just getting into this possibly getting well, into this like think about as a girl like going through puberty like and 
you know, their body's changing and now you're telling them they, you know, they're, they're, they might gain a little bit of weight when you go through puberty and now you're telling them that's not okay. And now you need to control that and all that. Stuff. Like, it's just not, and going, like your body, like your body's going through all these changes. And then to think about that at the same time, I don't know. It's just, uh, it's crazy to me. It's just crazy to me. So. Just, just not a, just not a great message to send, especially to females who, you know, are going through so many changes at the time. I mean, age. Um, but but uh, you know, I really appreciate you like opening up about like the eating disorder on the show, and you know, I think it's just something that people, people, people need to hear. Like we talked about in the green room, like you're not alone. You know. No, no. Uh, yeah, people are. You know, we're all going through something and eating disorder is one that I think and body image is one that I think many people struggle with, uh, males, females, like all of us. Uh, so thank you for being open about that. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, but now, um, bef uh, before we end the show, we're going to get into the rapid fire section. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no hard hitting journalism here. These are not any gotcha questions. These are just... <laughs> Uh, we've only ever had one person ever look up the questions and cheat sheet them before they got on the oh, show. I didn't cheat. <laughs> I didn't cheat. <laughs> but, Jen, are you ready for the rapid fire? I'm ready for the rapid fire. All right. Let's do this. Uh, so, um, candy corn, yay or nay? Uh, uh, yay. Uh, oh, oh, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think I'm okay with it. I don't know if Jason will like it. Um, <laughs> apparently, they made like a bacon flavored candy corn. I don't know about that. Um, I can't have too much because like whatever, it kind of starts to give me a headache after a while. But I love, and I love the pumpkins. Love the pumpkins. Maybe that's not candy corn, but the little, I don't know what they're called. Those are good too. Okay, I'll give you, I'll give it to you on the pumpkin one. Um, peeps, yay or nay? Nay. No. You know, it's, it's funny, we've had people will talk about everything from peep jousting to uh, stale peeps. Um, peep jousting is where you take like toothpicks, and if I'm getting this right, if you take toothpicks, um, you know, connect like the peeps and you put them in the microwave and they'll fight with each other. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> I know you can put them in the microwave and they blow up, I've heard, right? That's a thing. Yeah, and then you put the toothpick, and then they'll start fighting with each other. <laughs> now I want to go get some peeps. It's yeah. Easter's over, and I'm sure they're on sale. I should go get some, some fighting peeps. <laughs> yeah, peeps, if you're listening to this, like, you've got sponsors at this point. We've got three people who do peep jousting. Um, so, uh, uh, red velvet, is it a real flavor, or is it just chocolate with red dye? Oh, that's a good question. I think chocolate with red dye. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the right after. <laughs> um, Ore uh, Oreos, the uh, the cream and the cream filling or the cookie? Cream filling. Yeah. <laughs> the whole stuff, the best. Um, uh, when you go, uh, when you do a workout, uh, let's say you're going for a run, do you listen to music, podcast, or nothing at all? Uh, I always listen to something so it's either i'm on the phone with a friend so mostly music sometimes podcasts i i when i ride my bike i'm podcasts that's kind of my thing yeah right. what uh, what podcast have you been listening to recently uh oh my god god the glenn and doyle one we can do hard things i like uh dax peppers uh, armchair expert uh there's yeah that's pretty much the uh, Chelsea Handler's. Sometimes, if I need a good laugh, I listen to hers. But hers is also kind of insightful. Um, those are kind of my three two, like my three go tos. So, yeah. Um, do you have a do you have a favorite TV show? Um, Not. Do you have a favorite TV show that you watched recently? Oh, I started watching The Company You Keep. It's like I think ah, it's pretty new. Uh, I really don't. We don't have cable. I guess we have Netflix and we have Hulu. But I will say when I'm doing my job as a tax accountant, sometimes I have my laptop in the background and I'm listening to something. <laughs> so that the benefits of working from home. <laughs> yeah, work from home. <laughs> um, 
Well, Jen, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was uh, the great conversation and, um, you know, you're welcome back anytime and um, really appreciate you uh, taking the time to chat with me. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, and I hope you have a great uh, rest of your evening. Yeah, thanks. You too. Bye. Bye.